So if somebody gives you an ECG to look at, how should you approach it? Where should you start? Well, have a quick look at the name and the age and the date. Different things happen to people at different stages in their lives. Have a quick look at the technical aspects. Look at that calibration box. Does it look as I have described? Are there any leads that have fallen off? Is there a lot of electrical interference? Then we'll get on to the nitty gritty of the reporting. And the first thing that I like to know is what the rate is. And by that, we're talking about the QRS rate, which provides us usually with our pulse rate. Then the rhythm and then the axis. At that point, if you can see an obvious abnormality, state that then. If you can't see anything, then go through each bit, bit by bit. The P wave, then the PR interval, the QRS, ST segments and T waves. Hopefully, by the end of that, you'll either have decided it's normal or you will have spotted the abnormality. So if we're thinking about how to work out the cardiac rate, there are various ways in which you can do it. Firstly, obviously, you can look at the number at the top of the page, but obviously that may be inaccurate, so you need to know other ways as well. One way is to count the number of large squares between two consecutive R waves. 300 divided by the number of large squares gives you the heart rate. Two squares would give you a heart rate of 150 beats per minute. Three would give you 100, four, 75, five squares, 65, six would be 50, etc. Another way is to count the number of R waves on the rhythm strip at the bottom of the page. The rhythm strip is a 10 second continuous recording of the heartbeat. Therefore, if you multiply the number of QRSs by six, that will give you the heart rate. That's particularly useful if it's irregular or if it's slow. Next, I come on to the rhythm and it's very simple. All I really want to know is, is it regular or is it irregular? Is it regularly irregular or irregularly irregular? Bit of a tongue twister. Can you see P waves? Are the P waves related to the QRS? Finally, the cardiac axis. Now people get a bit flummoxed by this, but I have to say it is quite straightforward and all you really need to know is if it's normal, left or right. So what I suggest is you look at leads one and lead two and look at the QRS deflection. If it's a positive deflection, as, as in mostly above the isoelectric line, and it's positive in both lead one and lead two, this is a normal axis. So if it's positive in one and two, this is normal. If it's positive in lead one, but negative in lead two, then they're pointing away from each other, and that's a left axis, left leaving, they're leaving each other. Left axis deviation, left leaving. If it's negative in lead one, and positive in lead two, they're reaching towards each other, right reaching. It's a simple way of remembering it. So normal is positive in both one and two, left leaving and right reaching. So why does that work? Some people like to know a bit more about the theory as to why it works. I told you to look at leads one and lead two of the limb leads. A deflection towards lead one will give you a positive deflection. Normal is from minus 30 to plus 90. So towards lead one is within the sh shaded box. Towards lead two is within the second shaded box. And if you look at the area that is common to both of those, i.e. positive in one and two, that corresponds with the normal axis. A left axis deviation would be around the colour of the left of the yellow, and a right axis deviation would be following the blue line. So now I'm just going to go through lots of ECGs and we're just going to talk through them. We we'll use it to look for abnormalities and also to talk a bit more about what's normal on an ECG. So here we have an ECG of an unknown person and the technical aspects of things, you can see there's some baseline wander on the rhythm strip where it goes down off the page and then back up again. This is often just to do with a little bit of impatience with making the recording. If you wait a bit longer, it will have stabilized. It also accounts for the jumps between some of the leads at the end of each lead. Quick glance at the calibration box and that looks normal. So let's go through it bit by bit because there is no obvious abnormality here. The rate is around 80 beats per minute the rhythm is regular with P waves present, so it's sinus rhythm. And the axis, if we look at lead one and lead two, is normal. Sometimes you get slight variation in the heart rate with respiration, which is a normal phenomenon called sinus arrhythmia. Let's go through bit by bit. The P waves, if you remember, are quite good to look at in lead two. And here, just eyeballing them, they look like quite a normal size and shape. 
The types of abnormalities that you can get with P waves, for example, you can get something called P mitrally, and that's due to left atrial enlargement, the mitral valve being, of course, on the left side of the heart. Left atrial enlargement, P mitrally, gives you an M-shaped P wave, a bifid P wave. And that's how I remember it, mitrally M, bifid M-shaped P wave. The other abnormality you can get is called P pulmonale, and P pulmonale gives you peaky P waves, which are tall P waves, more than two millimetres tall. And that's due to right atrial enlargement, such as you might see, for example, in chronic lung disease and COPD. Here, though, these P waves look entirely normal. The next thing we're going to look at is the PR interval. So for the PR interval, you need to measure it from the beginning of the P wave to the beginning of the QRS. And it should be three, two, five small squares. Each small square on an ECG, if it's normally calibrated, is 0.04 milliseconds. So three, two, five small squares from the beginning of the P wave to the beginning of the QRS. Now, these ECGs are quite old and photocopied several times, so unfortunately you can't really see the small squares, but five small squares makes up one larger square. So this looks perfectly normal. Next, we're going to look at the QRS complexes, and you can look at the size and the shape and the width of these. Just to start with the width, the maximum width of a QRS complex is three small squares, or 120 milliseconds, and these look nice and narrow. We'll come on to more detail about various other abnormalities, such as Q waves and size of QRSs on later. Next, we're going to go on to the ST segments. So these should be flat along the same line as the segment between the T wave and the next P wave, and these look fine. And finally, the T waves. Most T waves should be upright. AVR is your upside down lead, and therefore T waves are always upside down in AVR. There are certain leads that you're allowed to see T wave inversion in. You're allowed T wave inversion in lead three. You're allowed it in V1, and occasionally you'll see it in V2. But generally, in an adult, you should not see T wave inversion beyond V3. Certainly not in a woman. So these are normal. So in summary, we have here a normal 12-lead ECG, apart from a few technical issues.